on this Good Friday day, <laughs> we would like to uh, spend some time talking about the suffering Savior, the Savior who went to the cross and took upon himself all the sin of the world, which is for us something that will always be incapable of being comprehended fully. And it's going to be part, obviously, uh, of what consumes our worship in heaven as we now adore our Savior and then, without interference, uh, be able to adore him for all eternity. No one likes to suffer. And I think that's pretty evident in the way the people here in America and around the world <clears throat> view this matter of this uh, COVID-19, this coronavirus. And we do whatever we can to try and avoid the possibility of suffering with it. But we know the Lord's in control of all that. Last night, uh, Ruth and I were trying to get a little supper together. And uh, so many times we go into the refrigerator and we pile up some leftovers and we never know how long those leftovers have been in there. So last night, <clears throat> I went into the refrigerator and we were trying to just clean up some things, throw some hot dogs on and some miscellaneous other stuff. And uh, there was a bowl in there with tin foil on it, and I lifted it up to see what it was. <clears throat> and it was just a pool of green stuff. And I, I realized that this was pea soup, that is P-E-A soup, that had been sitting in there, not dated, and I had no clue how long it was there. But we don't like to waste food either. And so with no idea if it had been weeks or a week, it had to be at least a week, I took it out and I put, I put it in a pot and I told Ruth, I said, I don't know if this stuff is safe. I didn't like the idea of the suffering might, that might come uh, if we ate that stuff. And uh, so I remember that if you boil it real hard, that uh, it will usually kill uh, most uh, organisms. And uh, so I thought I'd try it. And I boiled that thing and boiled that thing and boiled it. And then <clears throat> we just stepped out and ran the risk and we ate it. And it turned out fine. And it may have turned out okay uh, simply because we boiled it. But the idea <clears throat> that we might suffer afterwards with whatever the condition might be uh, was not a pleasant thought. Uh, even though we enjoyed eating it. Uh, suffering, we avoid it if we can. The amazing thing about the Lord Jesus Christ is that he came into this world, God in the flesh, and knew he was going to be suffering. Suffering not only uh, in the course of his ministry, but suffering for our redemption there on the cross. Something happened on the cross that is only known among the Trinity as to how all of that could be accomplished for every human being that has ever lived in this world, lives now, or ever will live in this world. The Lord Jesus Christ died for them. Now, I know there are a lot of people who like to limit the atonement, so-called, limit the redemptive work of Christ, but uh, the Bible doesn't. And they take sometimes the 
more difficult scripture or the scripture that would require perhaps a, a greater exercise in study than, than perhaps other parts. And uh, they make that the standard rather than understanding uh, the easier scriptures su such as John 3.16. And these e there's even truth so profound in that that we can't fully grasp it. But uh, when we talk to children, uh, there are so many things that they can understand. And uh, that's our basis for starting. And so we interpret the more difficult scripture by the easier scripture. And there are people that even debate that. But uh, you could go all the way on your way to heaven and keep on debating with everybody. But in the final analysis, you have to settle yourself down and study the word and compare scripture with scripture and uh, trust the Holy Spirit uh, to bring you through um, to an understanding that is biblically true. People will disagree and the Lord Jesus will straighten us all out when we get to heaven. But Jesus Christ came into this world for the express purpose of going to that cross, and he makes that clear. As we look back on his ministry briefly here, Jesus healed many who were sick. The leaders took counsel on how to destroy him. He cast demons out of those who were possessed. The leaders called him the devil for doing so. He cast out demons, and people asked him to leave. He forgave sins. The leaders said he blasphemed. He fed the multitudes. They continued to follow him for a free meal. He, the word of God in the flesh, taught the will of God, and the people were dull of hearing. A little girl was dead, and Jesus said she sleeps. The crowd laughed with scorn. He raised the dead. The leaders sought to kill him. And in John 12, 37, but though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. But look on our Jesus. In the midst of a sin-cursed and hardened humanity, the Bible says this, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not but committed himself to him who judges righteously. 1 Peter 2.23 And then again in Matthew 9.36 When he, our Lord Jesus, saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Let me ask the question, what kind of person are you? Are you soft and pliable in Jesus' hands, or are you a hard-boiled character? We see in Jesus, first of all, a perfect Savior. He kept the law perfectly. Galatians 4, verses 4 and 5 say, But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law for the purpose of keeping that law, which only he could do perfectly to redeem them that were under the law. Jesus did not offend in one point of all the law, nor in any way was their sin connected with Christ. No sin nature and no sin. He alone could qualify to be that perfect offering on the cross for us. Otherwise, we had no hope. The Old Testament shadows and types in the spotless lamb pointed to the true lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He kept the law perfectly. He was sinless. 1 Peter 2.22 says, He did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. 1 John 3.5 And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin or no sin nature. Even the devil was compelled to admit his righteousness. As Judas, after he had been indwelt by the devil, admitted that he betrayed a righteous man. Our Lord Jesus Christ could not fail. In Matthew 26, 31, 
we see that he is the shepherd to be smitten. And yet, we learn from the 50th chapter of Isaiah and verses, verses 5 to 7 that the Lord Jesus set his face as a flint. In Luke's Gospel, chapter 9 and verse 51, he was on his way to Jerusalem and um, he was firm in his purpose and the Bible says he set his face toward Jerusalem. And the idea contained in that verse is that he set his face like a flint, unmoved, unswerved. Every step that the Lord Jesus Christ took during his ministry were steps that would lead eventually to the hill of Mount Calvary. And so in the midst of a scattered and offended group of disciples, sometimes a group of disciples who were not understanding uh, what Jesus was saying about the fact that the Son of Man would die and on the third day he would rise again. And the Lord was telling that for six months before he went to the cross and they weren't comprehending it. But in the midst of all of it, the rejection by the world, the rejection by the Jews, and even the misunderstanding of his own disciples in some respects, he set his face as a flint. And Matthew 26 and verse 38, our Lord was there taking the disciples with him into the uh, Garden of Gethsemane. And he said, tarry while he went to pray. And they slept. His face as a flint. In the midst of a scattered flock, mocked and beaten, beaten to a bloody pulp. He was spit upon. He had his beard ripped out. He was slapped. There was a fake trial. But Jesus still set his face as a flint. Why? Why did the omnipotent Savior, who could have blasted them with the breath of his mouth or by a word received 72,000 angels. But listen to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2. Looking away unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of the faith, who for the joy that was set before him despised the shame and is set down at the right hand of God. Only a perfect Savior could offer a perfect sacrifice. And we read in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 18 and 19, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from your, your vain manner of life received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The only worthy one died for the worthless. The perfect son of man died for worms. And that's us. The sinless one died for the sinner. The righteous one for the unrighteous. The altogether lovely one for the unlovely. Yet God so loved the world. How do we how do we grasp that? But in all of our sin and our unrighteousness, in our separation from God because of our sin, God loved us. Are we worthy of this? Not one whit. The physical agony our Savior went through was excruciating. But the sin-bearing agony was infinitely worse. Remember the sweat and blood of Gethsemane? Was that physical torture and death? Well, it's not physical suffering and torture that is comparable to the cross. It was a step 
that he took toward the cross. The Lord Jesus, when he said uh, uh, about Father, uh, may this cup pass from me, was not talking about being dissuaded from Calvary or not uh, remembering and knowing, uh, even from all eternity, what his purpose was here upon the earth. But the fact that he was going through such suffering, even at that time, that sweat was being wrung out of him like droplets of blood uh, as he faced a uh, satanic attack. And Luke is the one that indicates to us that a, an angel was seen there uh, physically helping to strengthen Christ as he has yielded himself over to what the world would do at this point uh, and they would do their worst against the Son of God. They wanted to get rid of him. They did not want him. And we're still living in a world that largely does not want the Lord Jesus Christ. But keep in mind that the Savior was asking the Father to get him through that time so that he could go to that cross. He said in chapter 12, Shall I not drink of that cup? Uh, for that purpose came I into this world. So we don't see vacillating with our Lord Jesus Christ. And there was never anyone before or since Calvary that died the death that our Savior died. No one ever suffered like our Savior. And I know a lot of people have been through great suffering and sometimes suffering that goes over a long period of time. And people may say, our Lord had his suffering limited to six hours upon that cross. But what we need to understand, it was not only the physical suffering, excruciating as it was, it was the sin, the sins of everybody in this world that were laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's the one that cried out the following, as we read in Matthew 27 at verses uh, 45 and 46. Now from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land until the ninth hour. And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani. That is to say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, a lot of pastors that I've heard, and way too many professor Bible teachers, uh, many of whom just follow each other in what they say about things like this, and they like to go off on poetic license about what happened between the Father and the Son. And they say things like this. The Father was separated from the Son. The Father, if, it, if they don't believe that, they, they think that the fellowship between the Father and the Son was broken. Uh, if they don't believe that, they believe that at least the Father turned his face away from the Son. Well, there are all kinds of theological theories out there that a lot of people like to repeat when they hear it because they think this sounds good and it's dramatic. Nothing is more dramatic than what actually happened there at the cross. But let's remember this. A lot of people forget their theology 101. The Lord God Almighty is indivisible. There is no separation between the Father and the Son. The Father totally approved of what the Son did at the cross. It says that it pleased the Father to bruise the Son, to put him to grief. This was not something uh, that God delighted in, that is, that he delighted in the, the awfulness of what this world would do to his son and the fact that uh, sin and its ugliness had to be laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ. 
but he was delighted in the fact that uh, his eternal son was willing not only to fulfill the Father's will, but also to be the one that volunteered to go to that cross to be able to, to save us from our sins. Who alone could qualify to go to that cross and bear the sin of the world and uh, be the sinless one that was on the cross while he yet bore our sin? A lot of people make the Lord Jesus Christ out to become a sinner on that cross. And as I heard some preachers say, uh, he became a rapist, uh, he became a murderer, he became um, a fornicator. Uh, those things I consider to be blasphemy. He bore all those sins, and the Bible says in 1 Peter 2.24, he bore those sins in his own body upon the tree. The Father from Gethsemane forward gave his eternal Son over to suffering, that led up to the cross, and then he gave up his son to the suffering on the cross for the sin of the whole world. And so we're going to turn back to Psalm 22. And many Good Friday services through the 56 years that I've been in the ministry, I have heard uh, preacher after preacher describe that the father when he forsook the son was either separated from the son had fellowship broken with the son uh, turned his face away from the son on what authority do they say that not scriptural it's just their own emotional portrayal of things Yes, Psalm 22, verse 1 says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? And that word roaring is a powerful word in the Hebrew that, that refers to uh, all the hurt and the anguish and the agony that, that came, came up out in the groans of our Savior as he was there upon the cross. He says, Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy. Yes. O oh, thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. The Lord God Almighty was magnified in what the Lord Jesus Christ did at the cross. He's to be praised for what the Lord Jesus Christ did at the cross. Our Savior is to be praised. Our Lord said further, as reported here in reflecting on Psalm 22, Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted in thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee and were delivered, and they trusted in thee and were not confounded. And then the Lord reflects on, on what he senses and feels as he bears that sin. He said, but I am a worm. And the idea with regard to that, that worm is a grub that... Uh, when crushed yields a scarlet color and that's exactly what happened with the blood of our savior that flowed out of his body as as he was giving up his life for the the the, the sin of this world and the people of this world but he said i am a worm and no man a reproach of men and despised of the people all they that see me laugh me to scorn they shoot out the lip they shake the head they're saying he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. The Lord reflects, but thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Yes. Let's try and get this straight. That the Father abandoned a son there on the cross but in what way by turning his face away by by being separated which is impossible god is indivisible he's always one with his son and with the spirit the trinity is an indivisible one god eternally revealed in three distinct but not separate persons. 
The Word of God is clear on that. And when the Lord said, Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Let me ask you this question. Who could help the Son right there at the cross? Was the Father to say to the Son, Come down from that cross and show these people a thing or two? We'd have no Savior. We'd have no salvation. Were the angels in some way to intervene so that the Lord's suffering would end prematurely on that cross as he bore our sin? No. Because then again, there'd still be no redemption for mankind. Would our Lord in his almighty power take up the challenges and the jeering and the leering and the contempt and the hatred that was spewed from the mouths of of, of, of people that, that came from the hatred and the obstinacy of their hearts? No. The Lord would not help himself and come down from that cross. Only God in the flesh could be upon that cross. And listen to this. And at every moment on that cross be the victor go all the way back to Genesis 315 when it says there that that the seed of the woman would crush the serpent's head that's exactly what was happening there at the cross also but it also says that thou shalt bruise his heel oh yes those spikes went through his hands went through his feet right through his heel but let me tell you no matter what the devil or the demons tried to do to the Lord Jesus Christ at the cross to defeat him, no matter how awful the sin was that was laid upon the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter that the Father was helpless to, to intervene with the Son, no matter that the Son, in a sense, was helpless to be able to come down from that cross, Remember, the Father could have. The Son could have. There's almighty power there. But our Savior was almighty to stay on that cross until that work was finished. There was no point on that cross where our Savior was defeated. He is not a victim. He is the victor. And the Lord Jesus Christ conquered sin. He didn't become a sinner. He became the victor over sin in all the suffering that he endured there at the cross. He didn't die spiritually. That's not what the Bible tells us. He died physically. God came into the world in the person of his son to take upon himself a body, to take upon himself a human nature so that, so that he could go to that cross and become the sin bearer. And you know what? There's way too many people that get lost in the little tiny words in the English language. I want you to remember this. The father abandoned his son to T.O. The work of that cross. The father did not abandon his son on that cross. There's proof. Just read all of Psalm 22. For the suffering of our Savior was real. His cry out to the Father reflected that the Father could not intervene and the Son could not even intervene for himself if redemption was to be won for you and for me so that we would have a home in heaven and that our sins would be forgiven, eternally forgiven, so that the Lord Jesus Christ could could live inside of us, be our Savior forever. When the Lord said in Psalm 22, verse 19, Be not thou far from me. Is the Father not always omnipresent? Yes. Is the Lord Jesus Christ not always spiritually omnipresent? Yes. Isn't the Holy Spirit always omnipresent yes 
Be not thou far from me, O Lord, O my strength. Haste thee to help me. Deliver my soul from the sword, my darling, or my only one, from the power of the dog. Save me from the lion's mouth as they gnash on the Lord Jesus with uh, their teeth. For thou hast heard me from the horns of the oxen that, that would gore him as he was gored there at the cross. In verse 22, I will declare thy name unto the, my brethren in the midst of the congregation will I praise thee. Verse 23, Ye that fear the Lord, praise him. All ye the seed of Jacob, glorify him and fear him. All ye the seed of Israel. Here is the Father's answer to the Son while he was there on the cross. For he, the Father, hath not despised nor abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. Neither hath he hid his face from him. Believe the scripture. But when he cried unto him, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The father heard. But the Lord had to remain upon that cross until that work was fully finished. And when that work was fully finished, our Savior announced and shouted, it is finished. And that remains finished forever. Just a few other things to keep in mind with respect to the fact that the, fa the, the Son was never abandoned by the Father on that cross. Abandoned to the cross to get the work done. Let's learn our little prepositions in English. Let's really learn what the Scripture is actually saying. And right now, I'm turning to John chapter 8. In verse 29, it says, and he that sent me is with me. The Father hath not left me alone. For I do always those things that please him. Did not the Lord do exactly on the cross what pleased the Father? Absolutely. Psalm 50, or Isaiah 53 makes that so clear to us. This was something that pleased the Father so that redemption could be offered to this lost human race, to the lost individuals. And then again, in John chapter 8, <clears throat> do you remember, at verse 56 through 58, your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said unto him, You aren't fifty years old yet, and have you seen Abraham? Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, <clears throat> Before Abraham was born, is the idea there, Before Abraham was, I, I am. Did that change at the cross? Could the I am be split from the I am? In no way. Because... If such a thing were possible, and it's not, we'd have no Savior. Over to the 10th chapter of John, verse 30. I and my Father are one, essentially one, from all eternity to eternity, from everlasting to everlasting. And then again, I'm heading over to the 14th chapter, and it says in verse 10, Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? Did that cease at the cross? The Son being in the Father, and the Father being in the Son? Would the Father turn away from his own? Would he hide his face? Would he be separated? That's impossible. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. Again, we go over to the 16th chapter of John. And it says, 
in verse 32, Behold, the hour cometh, yea, is now come, that ye shall be scattered, every man to his own, and shall leave me alone. And yet I am not alone, because the Father is with me. Isn't that clear? We have a Savior who at every moment on that cross was victorious, and you can thank Him for that. You and I would see in the Scripture that the perfect sacrifice had to come from the perfect Son of God. The perfect Savior. And now the Lord is looking for us to live a perfect service. Not flawless because we know we still have flaws and, and the sin nature inside of us. But we have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The power of the Holy Spirit works inside of us to endue us with strength and power to be able to live to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in a, a full surrender to him. I wonder if you and I are doing that even today. Let's be faithful to, the, to witness to this wonderful Savior of ours. I want you to notice something here before we close in prayer. There is a book written by a young fellow in our congregation who I used to, uh, he used to come to my study uh, before he was married and he would uh, uh, translate Hebrew with me and, and Greek and we'd study these translations together and I'll never forget uh, saying to him, John, uh, when we translated through the 22nd Psalm, I said, if you take a look at those words, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There is a thesis study in there as he was studying for his master's degree. He wrote that thesis, polished it up, got it together in a book, one, one of the editions of this book has all the Hebrew and Greek in it. Uh, another one is more uh, just with the English for those who are not familiar with the Hebrew and Greek. And it is entitled, Pushing Against a Mystery. And it's available. This Pushing Against a Mystery is available for $8.50, which is almost unbelievable that it could be that cheap and yet uh, have so much in it. Uh, this is the best study that has ever been done from any book, from any person I have ever heard. You need to get this. And you can uh, find it on the following place, thebookpatch.com. Thebookpatch.com bookstore. And... It's a thrill to be able to see from our studies together how he took that challenge and worked on that and put it together in a masterful master's thesis. I praise the Lord that he's in our church and, and uh, uh, having fellowship with us even to this time. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, thank you for the miracle of Good Friday. Thank you for the miracle of Calvary. Thank you for the miracle of the Incarnation, for the miracle of your suffering, for the miracle of your victory on that cross at every moment on that cross, for a Heavenly Father who gave you up to that cross but did not give up you to you on that cross. He was with you. And Lord, you cried out out of your agony and it called attention to Psalm 22. And the scripture says so clearly, and when he called, he heard. The Father heard. And we thank you for that. And we pray for the salvation of any who are listening right now who have never said to the Lord Jesus Christ, I'm a sinner. I'm so sorry for my sin. Lord Jesus, I ask you to come into my life. Forgive me of that sin and be my personal Savior. Lord, I just pray that any who might be listening to this who have never uh, prayed before to accept Jesus into their heart and their life, that they would do it now and know that they are secure for all eternity. They are hidden in the palm of the Father's hand. They are hidden in the Savior's hand. They are hidden together with Christ in God, as we are told in Colossians 3. 
thank you for that and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.